Hey everybody, it's Matt Powers. I'm an author, educator, entrepreneur, citizen scientist, and family guy. And I teach people all over the world how to live more regeneratively, how to partner with nature, how to leverage the regenerative science to make the world a better place. And in that effort, I've come across some like weird stuff, right? And so I wanna like talk about some of that today. And from what I'm seeing is there is uh, a choice being made between socially painful versus socially empowering solutions to the global depletion, degradation of natural resources. So a lot of people, you know, they say climate change is everything. You can't measure it. Da, da, da. Well, you know, like desertification, you can. And everything, you know, when you start boiling the, all the climate change and all the numbers and all these things down to what you actually can represent as what changes a local climate and then scaling that up to a global scale, which is what we've done. Desertification, the degradation of natural resources, the watershed, the soil, the forest, the grasslands, the animals, all of these things that make the clean air we breathe, the water we drink, all of it possible, they're degrading. And so it's not as controversial as you would think. That's the problem with where we're at right now is we've created this weird debate around this and mixed in all these different things because when we degrade our ecosystems and we lose our soil, we lose the forest, we lose the watersheds and the aquifers, that's a failed ecosystem. And we've seen that time and time again. We've seen it throughout history. And it's failed ecosystems that we're really talking about because a civilization go is undermined and then goes along, goes down with the sinking ship that is the ecosystem. So they're intrinsically linked. So the weather, the water, you know, all of these things start shifting into a more desert pattern. So the rain systems, they, they, they start having floods and then pouring the rain only a few times a year or once a year or once every three years, depending on how desertified you are. And so it's erosive, it's violent, and everything's dried out. So it's hydrophobic soil. And it's part of the why that pearls up and keeps going. And so y you, you have a more violent water system, water cycle happening. You also have weather that's, you know, colder at night and hotter during the day, more broader fluctuations in temperature, more erratic weather. We have all those things happening. But, but don't take my word for it. Let's ask your memory. Do you remember the Fertile Crescent where, you know, Western civilization began? How fertile is it today? No, it's not fertile at all. It's, it's a rack. It's desert. What about the Lus Plateau? That's where agriculture began in China, and the same exact thing happened, right? They, they tilled it until it was no longer productive, and then they grazed it to death, and then it became a desert. People were like starving there and stuff. It's so sad. But what happened? You know the story, right? Don't you? Don't you? It's, I'm smiling because I know the story. The Lus Plateau restoration project, the hydrological restoration project, was an incredible success. And in nine years, it reversed 10,000 years of degradation. And it was a U.S., China, and World Bank joint effort. Why? Because they needed that, that area to be economically productive. Because it had hit the point of just, you know, people are starving there and it's because of the environment. And so they just had to go in and fix it. And it wasn't hard. It was perennials and earthworks. I mean, it was hard work. No, no, no doubt, no doubt. But it wasn't complicated work. It was something that we can teach to children everywhere all over the world. It's called permaculture. Um, and it's, it's very, very, very simple. Agroforestry, agroecology, whatever name you want to use, that, that empowerment of those local peoples made them 
into wealthy, proud people who took pride and actually <laughs> they negotiated ownership of those lands. And so they really had to empower the people for them to do the work. So they, they go hand in hand, you know. <laughs> if you, you, they they got to go through the doors together. You need both keys to turn, you know. And so I, I, really, I really value the Los Platos story because it shows what can be done in the Middle East. And we see with Neil Speckman's work at the Albeda Project and then later in regenerativeresources.co in Africa, along the coastlines of Africa, they are greening the desert in some of the most impossible circumstances. And so we really do have the ability to reverse 10,000 years of erosion, of tillage. And so when you think about 10,000 years of tillage, and tillage is, is the, the main way we lose carbon. And I know they're, they're going to tell you it's, it's the gas in your cars, and that's sped up our tillage, that's sped up agriculture, and the biggest sink for, for carbon is the soil and the plants. So the plants are the only thing that will suck down the carbon and turn it into soil properly. And it's the only thing that's going to take in the CO2 and release oxygen efficiently for free and, 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 and do so many other services in their ecosystem. It's the only thing. So we really have the ability. If we want to bring in all the CO2, we can do it very easily, very quickly with marine permaculture, bringing back the upwellings, bringing back all the life, cleaning the oceans. All of that can be done, and it's affordable and easily done, just like with greening the deserts and rebuilding the soils. Most of the Western land in, the, in America is owned by the government. So literally, this is just a will. They, they, they know what they're doing. They, they know how it's fixed. They paid for the Los Plateau to be fixed. So these governments, these world banks, these, these, gov uh, these um, international banking uh, consortiums, they know. And in more recent history, we have the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl, the weather changed fundamentally. I mean, even in New York City, you had these dust storms that arrived, blotted out the sun. It changed the weather. You remove the sun, you cool things off. That's why when the multiple volcanoes go off, you can have a mini ice age. You can have a year without a summer. These things have happened repeatedly throughout history. So, you know, like everything's always on the table at all times, you know. Um, but, and that's the crazy thing with climate is it's affected by so many different things. It's a, it's a mixed bag. But we do know that, you know, you remove the trees, you remove the soil, you remove the water, uh, you make a land barren, and you get a completely different experience on that land. A different climate emerges. And we can do this very quickly. So, so that's what happened with the Dust Bowl, right? We denuded the landscape and basically desertified huge portions of the Midwest. And even to this day, we're trying to rebuild that topsoil that was, in some places, people say 8 feet. Some places, they say 20 feet, the topsoil that was lost. So climate can be changed by all these things, but I don't think climate is a very good word. And I think that, you know, they chose a lot of these things and glommed a lot of things together for very strategic reasons in the narrative. And we're, we're going to get into that because it really comes down to this. Why is it painful versus empowering in the narrative of solutions we have for climate change when it is desertification and degradation of natural resources, habitat, and our ability to regeneratively interact with it? Because if without that ability, you know, like in California with all the regulations preventing people doing permaculture, like uh, in some states where they don't let you collect any rainwater because they believe it's their property, the state's property, the rain, really? So you, we, we've got to, you know, start seeing through these things because 
why is it so painful versus empowering when literally you could have these people be the people that are fixing the problem like in the less plateau where they're becoming wealthy where after generations of starving and 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 seeing the world become worse and worse they're pretty proud of what they've done and in fact uh, everyone wanted to be like them it goes viral when people are empowered and the law was changed so that all of the slopes after a certain degree of slope and then in all the the wilderness and all these places you you can't deforest you have to leave the ridges you have to leave the the steep slopes all of them vegetated and this is i mean think about the carbon sequestration there has anyone calculated this no and so there there's 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 a lot of you know these things flying around here because when we just step back for a minute and think about it like relationship wise like how good does it feel like when someone's trying to like force you with guilt and shame it's like you're the reason it's your car it's and you're like something something ain't right here and and it's it's that toxic relationship bit that reveals like like we detect like deceit we detect a lie and there's greenwashing, there's advantage being taken, there's uh, co-ops, there's narrative, there's all these, uh, and, and co-ops, like they're co-opting, you know what I mean? Um, and, and there's hijacking, there's a lot of things going on that are muddying the waters so that the simple solutions that are empowering that make us resilient against a mini ice age or resilient against hot spells or drought time, all of that together, the, the resistance is very real. And, you know, like, hear me out because you might be like, Matt, it seems like you're just, you know, you're, 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 you're going off on, on a tangent here, or, um, seems like a little bit paranoid, Matt. Uh, but the, I think that they're here to take advantage of this space because for me i've been in this space i've been working in this space of healing the earth for several years now almost 10 years now professionally and i don't think they're here to help i think that's like part of the the thing that we detect like you're not really here to help are you <laughs> uh, because i mean people have told me i'm shadow banned on ig and they're bigger than me and Insta on Instagram and they'll share my stuff and then they'll, they'll, their reach will just suddenly dip. And they'll be like, that's a sign that you, sir, are being blocked. And then, you know, William Padilla Brown had his, his, his account canceled and taken down. He was able to, you know, talk to people and work it out and, and find a connection into the, the meta block and get people to get a message into the right people and then they reinstated it but they reinstated it like with like all these other controls and he really couldn't have full access to his account so people are being attacked and censored all over and you know to go to even like the most extreme because i mean i may say things that are controversial i guess because I, I talk about stuff like this sometimes and in William Padilla Brown may talk about things that are controversial, but Eric Olson, Eric Olson, controversial. No, Eric's like the sweetest guy. Eric's trying to like do the right thing always. You know, when I think of Eric Olson, I, th I think of a person that is, you know, worried sick about doing the right thing. You know, he, he is such a good dad, husband and community leader uh, an empower of all people and really sensitive to that trying to seek out people who need help people who need to have you know an extra opportunity and to see him get canceled and removed from facebook and instagram without any kind of warning any indication and no recourse he, he can't form a new page or or, or or anything to to replace the amount of work amount of years and time that he put into forming that and there's no recourse hmm. so it feels a lot like 
we our narrative doesn't fit the narrative yet we're the ones that have been talking about healing the earth and literally going out and doing it i mean i've done you know backyard sites and i've written books and interviewed people who have done all the large work but i know them i'm friends with them there are so many amazing people who have done huge projects most of them not here in the u.s because um again those laws stand in the way of doing the right thing instead of empowering people to do the right thing more often than not. And so we all know what's possible, but they aren't promoting these people and these projects. That Los Plateau project, I don't know what it is, must be blacklisted from mainstream media in America. Because I've never once seen it talked about anywhere in the mainstream media ever. So, so you know, this is it feels like an us versus them thing but but you know you might say ah, it's the algorithms the algorithms are clearly just you know censoring anything with anything right but those algorithms are made by a person and they've figured out and done testing to prove that those algorithms are biased and so whether they're politically motivated or not they are identifying those of us who are bringing empowerment giving people the tools to be the solutions in their own lives to actually you know help their local economy help themselves and their families make money as they make the world a better place that's i think what's bothering them instead of us giving money to these giant international corporations or governments to take care of the problem and I think the reason they want to handle it, it's control, it's you know power, but it's also they want to milk it. That none of their solutions are fast paced. None of their solutions are honest. I mean, I know people on the carbon credit side. So many of those people are in it just for the cash, and they don't care about the math. They don't care about the funny numbers. They don't care about. They're just like whatever they can get away with. Shh, shh, let's keep going. And that that doesn't feel right to me. I think we should make like a real like industry that's regenerative, that keeps going and getting better and better every year, that powers itself and powers our community. That's what's preferable and not slow trickle, huge, dynamic, diverse, community-based, local economy, online economy, all of it, bioregional tying it all together so that we can have that be a, a group win. That's what the regenerative economy is. That's what all these solutions that we're bringing are. So it really de-emphasizes that federal, international, bank, mandate level and takes it down to individuals making good choices for themselves and their lives and teaching their children how to make good choices and discern and and to be ethical in their lives. So for me, this 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 conflict of narrative um, seems to be really about you know disempowerment, removing of rights by hiding responsibilities and opportunities for greatness. And 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 so they're gonna they're they're greenwashing. They're 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 messing up the science. And and I think part of it is they're messing up the science on purpose so that they can continue this debate and show um, like fault in what they're doing so that it continues the, the, the infuriate, you know, keeps people angry and frustrated. And uh, I mean, it is frustrating. Like, let's just be honest. It is absolutely frustrating that they teach like a piece of photosynthesis in school, but not the whole piece, right? You know, that CO2 goes into photosynthesis, releases O2. Where does the C go? It becomes sugar and goes into the soil, feeds the microbes, and the microbes create soil structure and long-term sequestration of carbon. That's what it is. It's that simple. And if you understood, all of us understood, and including me, you know, because I learned this later on too, from a very young age that the only way to enrich soils is with plants through photosynthesis. The only way to draw down more carbon is through photosynthesis. The only way to draw more energy into the soils for the, to 
to promote the fertility, mobility of nutrients in the soil is through photosynthesis. And the only way that photosynthesis properly works is through biology and living soils. I think a lot of us, the creators, people with platforms are worried about being deplatformed for speaking out. But as we can see, just saying the right thing in an innocuous way can get you deplatformed like with Eric Olson. That guy's a great guy. He's, a, he's just a good guy, just trying to do the right thing. Planting gardens and landscaping and teaching people how to, you know, how to live better. And they just took him out. So I don't think we're safe even if we try to hide, even if we try to play nice to avoid and self-censor. We need to speak out. We need to speak truth. We need to be great. We need to live regeneratively. We need to start on our, on our own sites. We need to start in our communities. We need to start online wherever we can. Plant the seeds for a regenerative future. And what does that mean? That means sharing the actual stories, the actual proven examples, the actual science of what is possible, of how the world actually works, of the actual human history. And when you come to realize, you know, George Washington thought America's downfall would be caused by soil loss and erosion. When you realize that Plato and Aristotle worried about the same exact thing, you'll realize that our environment and, and our future are inextricably linked and always have been. And it should be rather obvious, you know what I mean? People aren't starting, you know, um, bustling communities in the middle of a place without resources, even places like Dubai. I mean, the, the resource they have is oil. You know, uh, if you, there's no resource someplace, there's no way to have a civilization there. There's no water. There's no way. There's no money. There's no way. There's no food. There's no way. There's no soil. There's no way. So it's up to us to demonstrate it to our, our local communities to di help them disenthrall themselves from that fear-based, guilt, shame-based narrative to liberate them from that lie that they are the cause of all the, that is bad in the world. The reality is we've inher inherited a legacy of desertification, a legacy of tillage, a legacy of environmental decay and degeneration. And we luckily have the opportunity to reverse all that in under 10 years all over the world and to have our children, have ourselves be part of that solution to actually draw down all that carbon, but do it in a way that leads to even more carbon being released and cycled in situ in these forests so that the carbon being released is absorbed by the plants and the canopies around them. So decomposition feeds the forest. So exhalation from animals feed the forest. And yes, we're going to get way cleaner air. It's going to be higher oxygen levels and lower CO2 levels on the whole, but a lot more CO2 will be cycling and released, especially when we bring back fungi, because fungi, you know, is like a third of the soil in healthy soils. That, that fungi, when it dies, becomes a soil structure. So it's a legacy of fungi throughout all time that has created the soil structure. And, and when it decomposes things, it exhales CO2 just like a, a, an animal or a human being would. So we know when we bring back that, that fungi, all the soil that's been lost, you bring back that soil, it's going to release more CO2. But if you have plants in the soil and above it and canopies and food forests and native forests, it will be absorbed in situ before it even gets <laughs> to the poles and for ice cores and all that kind of stuff. This is what a vibrant world and a vibrant ecosystem offers us. So we have the science. We have the ability to take all this CO2 in. When they talk about how we lost 90% of the, the kelp forest off of the California coast along the west, the west coast of America, they're talking about a kelp forest that was already incredibly shrunken because when they were trying to settle that area and it was early on in maritime, you know, boats and stuff, 
it was almost impassable because there was such a giant kelp forest that ships would get stuck in it. It, it was so large, it boggles the mind how, and not just that account, how so many accounts describe the way nature was before science put a metric to it. So the amount of room we have in, because organic matter, all organic molecule, molecules have tons of carbon in them. That's what our structure is. It's, it's mostly carbon. And, and, and so we have so much room in the environment for carbon. So it's really not just carbon that is really not carbon. And they're using carbon as a correlative for what's going on. And yes, we're missing the carbon from all the animals and the plants. So that's absolutely true and absolutely on. But there, water vapor is the primary greenhouse gas that is causing global warming and making more violent weather. We are screwing up the digestive processes and the, the respiratory processes metaphorically of the earth. And we're going to talk about that next time. This is like part one. But we'll talk about that next time, you know, CO2 versus all these other aspects. Uh, because the reality is <laughs> there's a lot to this story. And it, it, again, feels like that guilt, that shame story is being used in a greenwashing, deceitful way. When the solutions are really straightforward and empowering and possible. So I just want to say, you know, what to do in this situation, you know, is be regenerative. I'll say it again. Be regenerative. Live regeneratively. And the reality is with all this is it reveals that they're scared. That they recognize that someone as sweet and innocent as Eric Olson, family guy, you know, children's author, who teaches people about, you know, like wildfire ecology and and families and happiness. I mean, his book on happiness is incredible. So these are the kind of people that they're censoring. And it's because they're empowering people and lifting people up. And I say, be lifted up. Be hopeful. Spread the message of hope. Spread the message of what's possible. Because the reality is, is they're scared. They're worried that because their, their narrative is unraveling in front of their faces. And people everywhere are on all sides of the board are, are, are saying, hey, what's going on here? Something's wrong. I don't like this. This doesn't make sense. And, and that's just it, is that there are things that make sense. The science is proven, and you already know it. For a lot of this stuff, you already know it because you know enough of history. You know enough of science. You have enough experience in the garden and in nature. We can fix this problem. We can reverse the, the desertification of these areas. So whether, you know, we're, we're headed into really hot weather or really cold weather, no matter what comes, we can be resilient. And then when it comes to all that big stuff, all the stuff that they're predicting, they're basing that all on averages of averages of averages, and none of those models extend out very far. It's much safer to actually look at what's real and what's already happened, which is what most scientists do. <laughs> most scientists aren't saying like, well, it's likely my experiment will look like this, so let us all now invest. No, <laughs> they run an experiment or they study something archaeologically and then they make conclusions. And what's incredible is we have tons of that uh, environmental examples of, of human man-made based, you know, uh, ecological degradation. We get tons of examples. The rise and fall of so many civilizations is based around that. They mishandled their water. They mishandled their soil. They mis... You know what I mean? Uh, population grew too fast for the resources of the bioregion. Uh, you know, any of the above. And so it's not controversial. That's the rub. I think that's the, the real issue with so much of this stuff is that they have tricked so many people 
into buying into this narrative that they can fix the problem, that people themselves need to just put more trust in authoritarianism, more trust in giant big businesses and international conglomerates and banks and governments and I think individuals, we all can can do our part individually without any force. And it's actually, that's where the greatness is when you choose. And if you force anyone into any of this, you steal their opportunity for greatness. So those are my thoughts. We're gonna have a part two on all this. Let me know if you like that. Share down below in the comments. I'm really eager to hear what you think about this kind of style talk. Uh, as well as with your thoughts on the talk itself and the topics here. Because uh, I, I can't catch it all. There, there's, a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of deceit going on on all sides at, at a certain threshold and level. And, and so it's really critically important, I think, through discussion, communication, honest, honestly trying to, to, to find truth in a group, and respecting each other and we'll arrive. I really believe that we have the ability, humans have the ability uh, when they're free, when they're uncensored, when they're allowed to connect with other people to, to, to really make a difference in, in each other's lives. And I am so grateful for all the people that are standing strong, all the people that are speaking out against censorship, all the people that are speaking out against all the 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 crazy things going on right now cuz there's so much. I can't even like really touch it because so much of it is designed in such a way that both sides are designed faulty on purpose so that you get involved and you get drawn in and you're wrong on, on quite by design. And I think that's why so many of us have our, you know, our back on our heels and just kind of watching the, the dumpster fire, you know, on TV and on our phones and, you know, the world around us. And, and, and the reality is we need to disenthrall ourselves from watching you know, the slow motion car crash. And we need to wake ourselves up and realize that we need to help the people in the car crash. We need to get people waking up around us aware that there's an emergency. People are in shock right now. People are just watching planes hit the towers. I was, I was in New York City during 9-11. We're in this weird hypnotic state where... <sighs> It happens in crowds. The more people are that are there, the less likely you are to get help when you're in danger. That's why I think in the 60s or 70s, there was a crime in New York City where someone was stabbed to death and they took over an hour and a half to be stabbed to death on a street and 30 people watched it happen. And it was because 30 people watched it happen. They all were expecting someone else to call the cops. Someone else must have called the cops and no one called the cops. And so this is one of those situations where they are pushing a narrative that we know isn't true, that we all sense is wrong. And together, we got to work this out. We got to uh, build some truth together and certainty together. That's why increasingly, you know, I do my own testing. I do my own DNA sequencing. Um, soon I'm going to have the bionutrient meter thanks to some incredible contributors. So we're going to go deeper and deeper seeking truth in my channel and the things that I do. So you're seeking out the truth and regenerative soil. And you know, like with science, that truth is ever evolving. We're always learning and growing and it's beautiful like that. Um, but but that's, that's what it is, is it's a pursuit and it's an honest pursuit, you know? And we're, that's what life should be, an honest pursuit of truth in it together to make the world a better place. So that's what my channel's really, you know, like the underpinning of permaculture, people care, earth care, future care is really all about. And and I just had to had to share, you know, what I'm seeing because there are empowering pathways to regenerating the earth, to regenerating the natural resources of the earth, the the natural services of our ecosystems, the clean water, the clean air, 
the beautiful coastlines and shores, the beautiful watersheds, rivers, lakes, and streams, all of it can be returned. And that's what we, we learn and talk about on this channel. So if you want, if you like that sort of thing, <laughs> like, subscribe, share. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And there's a part two on this where I delve deeper into CO2 versus pollution, water vapor, all of that. Because CO2 has a, a, like a real place in all that, but it's not the primary effect. It's not the primary leverage point in a lot of this stuff, though it is a critical linchpin. You can't get away from it being critical linchpin because carbon, organic matter is the reservoir for all energy in our soils and literally the charge, the energy of the earth has been depleted. And so there's less water in the soils. There's less carbon in the soils. And there's less mobility of nutrition and energy. Thus, I'll be talking about that more too because regenerative soil is restarting in March. <sighs> I appreciate you all. Please let me know down below what you think about this. Um, should I just stick to the science, Matt? Uh, or should I talk about more of this kind of stuff? Because, I mean, I'm seeing people like Eric Olson and William Padilla Brown, BD Platform, people are telling me, you know, I'm shadow banned. I feel like I need to, like, say something <laughs> while well, it still can uh, um, so that if I do disappear, you all know where to find me, the permaculturestudent.com, or just type into Google Matt Powers and the word permaculture and you'll find a ton on me. I appreciate you all. I appreciate the efforts and support you all put in to helping me make this all happen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll see you soon.